afternoon, everybody. It's uh, about 4.03 p.m. Today is Wednesday, January 13th. This is the first meeting of the new year for the Scarborough Town Council's Finance Committee. And um, I want to welcome everybody. And uh, the first order of business is a uh, call to order, so we have done that. Um, those present, uh, just for uh, notes, um, all members of the committee are present. We have uh, Councillor Hayes. Uh, thank you for returning. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, Councillor Paybine. And our newest member, uh, Councillor C uh, Chiazzo. So welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. We also have the town manager, the finance director, and deputy finance. I was wondering, um, and the deputy finance uh, director. And then uh, we also want to note that we do have Councillor Jean Marie Caterina in the audience, who has been told she's not allowed to speak today. But <laughs> and we have our wonderful um, um, our uh, record keeper and uh, best friend Colette, <laughs> um, who's taking notes for us. So everyone, welcome. Um, since we do have at least uh, one citizen in the audience, we will accept the public comments. If Councillor Caterina would like to make any statements in advance, she's welcome to do so. Not seeing any, we're going to move on to approval of the minutes from October 14, 2015. So moved. Any? Oh. I, I will abstain, obviously, not being present. Absolutely, if that's your desire. So um, any corrections, Peter, anything no. that you notice? I didn't Good. see any. Uh, move approval. Um, or, uh, uh, yeah, move approval. All in favor? Sorry. Two. One abstention. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to... to 201 abstention. Right. Next item, uh, um, review. So just to kind of, uh, just a high level overview uh, of continuity from the prior committees. Um, really what we're going to take in the next uh, one, two, three, four, five, th four items, uh, really, th no, excuse me, three items are continuation items from the last year, kind of to close them out and see where we stand and then we have some new items to get started. And then uh, we'll also have, and, and at the end we're gonna have a discussion around the budget review um, schedule and then the budget targets and then meetings and future items that we're going to kind of uh, do a little brainstorming on what we'd like to do as a committee. Um, so on the first item, which is item number five, it's a review and discussion of our financial statements for the period ending December 31st, 2015, keeping in mind that this is an internal um, um, unaudited financial statement. And I'll turn that over to Tom and Ruth. Go ahead, Ruth. Um, for Chris's uh, perspective as a new member, we put together financial statements that include, uh, generally speaking, the balance sheet accounts, the revenues, and the expenditures. Last year, the Finance Committee asked that we break it out so that we could show where we were last year at this time and this year at this time. So that's what the first two pages do. It shows your assets, liabilities, and fund balance. The second page shows, the first three pages, excuse me show the revenues compared to last year at this time, well, at December 31st, and then the expenditures, or vice versa. Quick quick question for you. Sorry. Um, I'm just looking at this year compared to last year, if you look at fund balance, there's a swing of about $800,000. Why, why is that? I mean, if you look up, it looks like it has something to do with accrued payroll, but just looking at wondering why our fund balance went down from December 2014 to 2015. The total fund balance looks right. like it decreased. However, um, yeah, there might be a number missing. The reserve for encumbrances isn't listed in 2015, although we're in balance, so I, I don't think that's it. I think it has more to do with the um, how the actual revenues and expenditures break out. As they show here, you see actual revenues. Well, I, I, the, the number that looks really different too is also accrued payroll. Why, why would it be so different if you're looking at the same time period? I mean, it's year-end. Accrued payroll is a once-a-year item, so that's theoretically what it was on June 30th. It just means that we had more, uns we owed more people payroll and related benefits at June 30th. So. Uh, we only make that adjustment once a year, and then it stays there for the whole year. But, but to his question, why would it be significantly different from year? I mean, that's a one uh, seven hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollar change. So, was it that we had more employees on the books? I mean, what was the cost? It could be that more people mm. waited until mm. teachers. I'm thinking more so than than uh, town employees. Town employees is just one week. So it'll be one week's pay. Teachers, 
they have the option of getting paid at June 30th for July and August, or they can get paid in July and August. And my sense is that, without actually checking with the school department, my sense is that more people took the July, you know, prefer yeah. to get paid <coughs> through the summer. Well, I guess what I'm trying to understand, and I think last time we had talked about, um, as you present this, I kind of have like just really keep it simple principles for us that, you know, highlight for us what we should focus on. But my concern would be if you look at 1231-14, 1231-15, our total fund balances have decreased, which would suggest we're spending more money than we're taking in, which raises a concern for me. So that's all I'm trying to understand is why is our fund balance going down? I hadn't anticipated that to be an outcome to be looking at it at this point. Um, everything that happens within the assets and your liabilities affects fund balance. Oh, I know that. But so that. But that. But that means that our assets are not going up as fast as our liabilities are. So that is why we have less fund balance. So I'm trying to figure out why. It's. I think it's just the normal course of operating system during the fiscal year. Yeah, and remember, you're looking at a snapshot mid-budget year. So there's a lot of things that can change. We do have some financials as of uh, end of June, so they're, they're audited numbers uh, that we can, be, we can be very yeah. specific about fund balance, and I think you'll see some, some very comforting trends, so, frankly, in that regard. <coughs> we could do, I guess we need to do some more analysis as to what the anomalies are yeah. mid-budget year. Is there anything to be concerned about in uh, our estimation? I think when you look at your actual uh, revenues and expenditures, that's really what drives Right. The front page. But that's, um, right. I've highlighted a couple of items that in the notes at the bottom of the revenues and expenditures, but pretty much everything is We're tracking revenue. similar to what it's done in the past. So I think one way uh, pictorially to solution a part of this is to maybe expand our reporting so that there is actually a second comparative point. So if we had December 2013, because then it would, it would reinforce your question about whether or not there's something to worry about because if, as an example, if in 2013 in December, um, you know, using actual revenues, if 2013 said that it was at 61 million rather than the 65 in, in 14, and then 67, then there's, that, there's a significant, there's a, there's a common trend, but if it was 67 in 2013, 64 in 14, and then back, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think the third point would actually show some deviation and maybe explain itself in its own picture um, a little bit. I also note on this front sheet, if you look up under the assets, there's a million dollar swing in due from other funds in 15, yeah, yeah. which would certainly have an effect on that bottom line. Um, I think that may be a timing issue in the top yeah. asset category. <clears throat> so the question, so yeah. actually it highlights the, to, to your original question. The only question I had is what significantly changed in the revenue category that has caused a $3 million or a $2.4 million change in revenue receipts? I think uh, that... From the, from the two periods. I mean, that's pure revenue. So something happened that caused that to come in better. Part of it has to do with um, we have higher taxes this year than we did last year, so that's going to affect it. Um, in the actual revenues, we accrue our property tax revenue, so we book the full amount of the revenue up front, and then we create the receivable. On the, uh, in, like, so you'll see in taxes receivable, that's where it all shows. So that's part of it, I think. So. So you think that the $2.4 the $2 million change is really a result of just higher taxes, tax collections? I think it also has to do, if you look on the third page, yep. it shows uh, on the school side, it shows that they received $38.7 million for December of last year, and this year they've received $40 million. I think that's probably so I'm on the page three. Can, I'm on page three. Can you point me um, in the... You see where it says total general fund revenues highlighted oh. towards halfway down. And then there's fund 7150, which is a no. Dead. Hold on a second. Where are we? Right here. Oh, fund 70. Sorry, I got new glasses too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to be far sighted, near sighted, and now I'm bifocal, and I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, so 41 million versus the 43, or 42 versus the 43. So that's up. Okay, 
so that, and actually I do see where the tax is under line 90 under 1100 there is a $300,000 shift from last year to this year uh, sorry there's a $600,000 shift from last year to this year so that's a that's a I get that tax rate huh that's, that's higher, higher tax rate yeah, that, I get so I get that so out of the 2.4 there's like 600 it's about okay. a million and a half yep. higher revenues this year than last year so actual revenues I think that's what no I get that however the revenue on the school side it was supposed to be 38.9 but we actually got 40.4 .4, so that's eight hundred thousand dollars more so that's one just between those two it's 1.4 million dollars right are you looking at 14 or 15 I'm looking at uh, right below fund 7100 general school general fund revenues just the revenue by itself they actually received 38.9 million comparison this year they've got 40.4 .4, so the revenue is higher as well right just year to date right just year to date yeah yeah, yeah. through December of but it explains the movement it explains 60% uh, 70% of the movement I get that okay now I get that yep so Ruth a quick question on the liability side um, you've got a in December of 2014 is a two million dollar line for bonds payable and there's nothing in this year is that just a timing thing or is that last year the council author or the year before the council authorized us to purchase the Benjamin Farms property so we did what was called a bond anticipation note and um, just, a sh just a short term bond and that's why we put that here uh, it was paid off in May of 15 so it, there aren't any more. All right so that's not that's not general bonding that's a one time correct well, okay it was an anomaly in 14 basically okay. that we won't see very often okay we actually needed the money before we would actually go to bond if we could have waited until March or February or March which that wouldn't have shown up at all yep. they closed I think in December or something. Mm -hmm. okay any other questions regarding the balance sheet? Yeah. So, so sorry, oh, sorry. Just to back, back on the liability section again. We've got um, uh, the three bottom ones: tax collected in advance, due to capital projects funded encumbrances. And again, nothing in the left-hand column, and, and the encumbrances was fairly high last year. Is, is that also an anomaly, or is that just a, a timing issue? It's again a timing issue. Normally speaking, those do show up. They might have been uh, rolled into one of the accounts payable numbers. Okay. Yep. It looks like it was public. A big portion of those public works. It typically is. Yeah. So it is accounted in another section. It's not like we're anticipating that that amount showing up later on. It's already been in. No, it's already okay. there, and it and that is based on what people the departments <coughs> are uh, preparing to order or are in the process of ordering. Yep. So those numbers will change. We try to commit those funds so they don't use it for other purposes. Yep. So um, just to make sure that, um, so I don't know if it's valuable on the following statements, but at least um, how difficult would it be to add the 2013 numbers on the balance sheet side? Is that hard? I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to ask for something that's too difficult. <laughs> you know, I like you. Okay, I just want to make sure. The more I think of it, I think that $2 million bond anticipation um, number um, is really one of the major drivers as to why those numbers look so different. Mm -hmm. Which number? The $2 million uh, bonds payable, that, uh, that short-term borrowing we had for the Benjamin Farm. It shows in the bottom line number kind of $2 million artificially high. So it's counted in 14 column. It's not included and will never be included in 15. So that, that alone accounts for $2 million difference between those bottom line numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, no. Be, no. Be, well, if that wasn't there, your fund balance would have been higher in Actually, 2014. Actually, cash would have been lower because it's just between liabilities and cash. Let me, I, I'm still. So can I uh, second? So so if I look at fund balance, we're off about a you know, 700. Let's let's 400 plus eight. Um, no, two plus. It's about 700. If you look at expenses year to date, on page two, comparative year to date expenditures, we have a total appropriation of 35.6 million, compared to last year of 34.8. So that's. That's about a million buck increase. 
But if you look at the year-to-date expended so far, you've got about a million dollar increase in the first six months. So it looks like we've accelerated the expenditures in the first six months of 2000. The whole increase in appropriation has been spent in the first six months. Does that make sense? No, I think um, some of it has to do with the capital equipment. Some of it has to do, we have more debt. We have about $200,000 more in debt, if you look at the debt line, than we did in the prior year. Yeah, but like, I guess my point is, again, if, if, if the total appropriation was $35.6 for all of 2050, there... About a $700,000 increase over last year's appropriation. Right, but then if you look at how much has year-to-date been expended, almost all of that whole annual increase has been spent in the first six months, right? So I'm just, I'm just saying it looks like that's what I think is, is causing that distortion in the fund balance. I'm trying to understand have we truly accelerated our expenditure so that we're actually going to come out above budget? I mean, we're already at 62.5% of the appropriation being spent in the first six months. Does that mean that we're going to have a surprise if we keep up at this pace, and are we going to keep up at this pace the rest of the year? There are two things that drive that 62.5%. The first okay. one is the debt, because we pay all of our principal in October uh -huh. or November. So there's 220000 right there. Right. And we pay some print interest on top of that, too. In March, we'll pay the rest of the interest. So that's one of the factors. The second factor is we pay all of our county tax yeah. by, um, and that's a two and a half million dollars. That's 150,000 higher. Mm -hmm. And that's higher. I, there's 370 right between county tax and debt. There's 370 thousand dollars right there. And if I could just point out too, it's it's coming back to me now about the accrued payroll. Uh, I sat in on the schools finance committee meeting, and they had a an incident where the payroll landed on. It landed on a holiday week or something, so they were advised oh, to, to push that payroll to a different uh, a different time, and that skewed to me. It looks so. It doesn't, we're not actually seeing an increase in employees that's yeah. accounted yeah. for that difference. Yeah. That's a timing issue of when payroll was. It's probably one more one additional week's pay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Something so, like that. so it's not. I don't. I don't believe yeah. it's new employees that we've got. You know. It's the other thing that I looked at. Um, were the percentages that were actually um, received or spent between the two years, and um, there weren't a lot of differences amongst them, so that told me that we were pretty well tracking year to year on what we were um, either okay. collecting or spending, and if there was a difference, I tried to note that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, just to actually, if you look at the three components that have the greatest increases over the year, and it's a factor of their budget, is fire services is about 100 grand, police services about 180, and that's the difference between where they were last year, just in a dollar value, mm -hmm. and then $200,000 for public works, let alone, and then the debt and the county tax that you talked about, which was another 370, so that's 870,000 out of the 950. Um, so I, I, so I understand, I, yeah. I don't remember what caused the increase in public in the police services budget, but I believe part of the fire department budget increases had to do with uh, the new position. Dispatch, dispatch yeah, I think, is oh, what dispatch drove with the police Oldorcher services. Beach. So you then have to look at the revenue. Yeah, that would offset with some revenue, revenue, correct? Correct. Okay. Good. So to, to the extent, and I'd love to hear Councilor Chiazzo's point, on fund on the line item of fund 7100 even though gen, that of course the, the school's budget is supervised by the school board i mean that's a million dollars greater than last year is that the payroll effect that you were talking about that no, seems no. high for a one week or two week change no because i mean to go from 50 percent to 53 it seems to be a, there is a change in policy or a change in practice no, maybe not policy practice yeah. No, I don't. I don't, don't believe so? that's. And you were chair of their committee, so. Yeah, I don't believe that's driven by payroll difference. I believe that. Um, again, technology. Look, technology. It's part sorry, of it. I just can't. Yeah. That's epiphany. Yeah, yeah it's almost a two million dollar difference. Yeah. Right. Look, uh, sorry. Yes, it's a two million dollar difference. Right. And their budget went up up by over um, millions. The overall budget is higher. Right. So I think that would. It's probably technology. Okay. Yeah. I get that. I mean, to me, the bottom line is, is we might be a percentage or two off in terms of where we are comparative to last year. Um, but again, unless, from what I heard on the school side of things, 
um, that can be attributed to a timing issue with payroll and some other issues that, at least from the school side, they seem to be right, relatively on track with no surprises. And I'm, I, looking at this, I'm, I'm hearing a similar thing from you, Ruth, that it's, it seems to be more of a timing issue that the percentages aren't so drastically off that we've got to start planning or taking the contingency into effect now. What we'll do is we'll get clarification on two points, the, uh, the accrued payroll piece on the school side, just so we can advise you correctly, and also uh, ask them about the what accounts for that difference in the year-to-date expenditures, <coughs> that $2 million difference. We'll get that to you in, certainly before your next meeting. Sure. So this leads to a thought, I guess, for us to consider going forward. Um, with this discussion around the actual dollar values, how do we then relate this information into a qualitative discussion around what is the best metrics to determine, or what is the, not metrics, what is the best, yeah, well, metrics. Um, what is the best, I mean, how do we evaluate this information to determine, because there's seasonality in every financial statement um, in any company or in, even in municipalities. So, you know, should we be excited because there is a decrease of, the fund balance of, um, um, you know, 900000 You know, at what point do you get nervous? You know, you know what I'm saying? How do we kind of use that information to make decisions, um, and let alone how to ask questions going forward, because I think that's going to be important so that we don't overreact? One, one item that uh, I found positive this year is under property tax collections. At right now, we're at December 31st. We were at 51.1%, which we would normally expect to be over 50%. Yeah. Normally, we're around 48 to 49 percent. So we're, we're, our collections are better in that respect. So, John, I mean, uh, you're, you're raising a good point. I don't have a good answer for you. Frankly, putting this sort of stuff in front of a lot of different eyes and have, having this conversation and teasing out uh, and understanding what the what the differences are year year to year, I think, is certainly a good start. Um, well, and this is where, you know, we've talked about this before and did last year and we didn't move on it, but we will this year hopefully, and that's about the dashboard, you know, looking at a historical dashboard that says here's where you are and you can, you know, as an analyst um, and a critic or however you want to label kind of a person that reads this information is, you know, how do you respond to that information and then going from two points in time is hard. Um, but it's also getting the information and then using it right is also even more difficult. Well, I think, frankly, we can do a better job of um, doing some analysis before and flagging, like Ruth's done with these footnotes on the, yeah, on the other the support fund. sheets. No, that's, I, we yeah. probably should do the same with this fund balance sheet uh, yeah, to yeah. anticipate the questions. Sorry, I guess for me, it's, you know, I mean, to me, to do a comparison uh, year to year on existing line items and existing budgets kinds to, doesn't give me a very uh, uh, a, a good picture of terms of where we are generally. It tells me where we are in relation to where we were last year and whether we have challenges or not. I guess my question as a, as a new member coming in would be what kind of benchmark or what kind of level can we look at in terms of saying, well, our expenditures on, and I'll just throw an arbitrary one out there, our, our payroll, for, se for example, is relatively high compared to X. You know, do we look, is there a metric that we want to pursue? And I don't want to open up a, a can of worms here, but is there something that we want to relate to or, or look to in terms of a metric, a national metric or a state metric or a regional metric where we could say, look, our payroll is a little bit higher we understand that, and then we can explain why it's higher. So if we know our payroll is higher than another municipality, let's say a South Portland as a general example, we can say we're higher because we have X number of extra people in public works, let's say, because we need X number of extra personnel to do whatever we're doing. So for me it would be, and I know I'm kind of, I don't want to dance around this too much, but it would be nice to be able to see a reference point of a much like we did, I think, on the school side of looking at a community or some kind of benchmark to know where our spending or our expenditures are in relation to what what's, would be considered appropriate mm -hmm. for something of this size. I don't know how we do that. That might be a, a very major undertaking. I don't want to... Yeah, the data set doesn't exist. We've attempted to create it. Uh, we've partnered uh, with eight or ten Greater Portland communities uh, and Ruth and her colleagues spent a lot of time teasing out that data because mm -hmm. not all organizations are created equal. Right. I mean, simple example, in our public works, we include street lights and water. and water. That's not true in all. So you've got to really spend time to 
to understand so you have apples to apples comparison. Yeah. Um, we've attempted to dust that off. In fact, Ruth and Gina have reached out to their colleagues. We haven't had great response back from them because it's kind of a pain in the what I can do, though, is I'll, I'll provide you the last good data we have in that regard. I think okay. it's 2011. I have 11. 13 almost done. Okay. So th those are indicators, and, sure. and things haven't changed widely. You know, I think we've tracked similarly. So um, I'll, I'll dust that off and send that around to you. That's the best that exists today, and we'd love to do this on an annual basis so we have good, fresh data. It's just a matter of getting people to respond to our surveys. Right. Okay. Um, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Sean, I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, part, part of the reason I, that I focused on the fund balance, because yeah. that last year as we got to the budget season, those fund balances became a pretty important consideration to how we would use those to, as we go through the process. So I just think, you know, mm -hmm. understanding what's happening with that, you know, as we move through the budget process is going to be really important as we get toward the end to really know what, what we're looking at, because I know the numbers kind of fluctuated. So that's why I was just trying to flag it. So a good, no. you know, I like to kind of think about from this point forward as we review these, what that fund balance is doing so it gives us an indication of what, what we might have available if we're looking to offset. Yeah, going forward. Yeah. Uh, Sean and I have talked about it, uh, whether that discussion is had among this committee or you do it as part of the, your joint meetings, mm -hmm. uh, because that's, that's a conversation that the, the Board of Education is, ends up being involved with, right. typically right. at the end of the budget but, uh, session. So two points of reference. One is that as we create the benchmarking, uh, which goes into the dashboards, right, because you benchmark in order to create the mm -hmm. dashboards, um, I view fund balance as a critical metrics that we actually monitor yeah. um, for, for us as well as capital ratios and a few other areas. So that becomes one of them that I definitely agree that we should then kind of monitor because there is a policy implication to follow. So in some sense, uh, we can go to our own policy and determine which policies they should all be, right? Um, if we have a policy around a metric, then so we should actually include it in the dashboard. The second is that um, we actually did have, and I didn't put it on this agenda, but we can put it on, uh, we did ask Ruth to provide a fund balance analysis um, at her convenience. And it looks like she actually came prepared, so she can pass it out. I don't have it as an agenda item, but it'll be good for us to be able to review that so that at the next meeting we may have a conversation around that. So, yeah, Ruth actually has some things just because the audit was just uh, disclosed last week. Um, we don't need to get into it in detail. We can point your attention to a couple of things and then pick it up in more detail at your next meeting or at your convenience. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about the fund balance and looking at some of the numbers on this is that we were, we're still working on our financials for June 30th. And I noticed, for example, in deferred tax revenues, Currently, it shows a million one thirty-seven, but really it drops down to eight hundred and something thousand in uh, at the end of June. So I think you're back on page one of the general on fund balance sheet. On page one, correct. Okay. So, so you know, right, yeah. some of these numbers are still in flux because we haven't finalized June, which of course yeah. is going to affect these numbers. Right. So, um, so on this sheet, if you will. So we're transitioning. This is the end of last fiscal year, right. June 30, 15. The second page, I'm going to start backwards, is, is the draft of what is going to be in the financial okay. statement. And it shows that our un unassigned fund balance is like the third number from the bottom. Went from 3.3 .3 million to 5 point, almost mm -hmm. 3 million. Uh, I'm going to say a big chunk of that's probably related to excise taxes and, you know, other things. But not all of that overall fund balance, the 9.6 to 11.6 is available for us to use because of our fund balance policy, right. mm -hmm. which is on the first page, which essentially says we can only use these portions of our fund balance to, to use in next year's budget, mm -hmm. if you will. So assuming the auditors don't change those numbers, the 2015 fund balance policy says we need to have at least $6.4 million, roughly. We currently have available 8.4. So we're at about 11%. <coughs> and then our fund balance policy says anything above 10 goes towards capital. So anything, um, yep. so really not all of that 2 million because I did the difference, but you know, some portion between 6.4 and 8.4 is available for capital use. So 
what I would like to do, if you don't mind, for the other counselors, is that um, if we can sit on this and take the information in, because I, I know I have a lot of questions around this particular issue. Mm -hmm. I know that others probably do too, and I'd rather take it in uh, and then come back with those. Um, and if the other counselors agree, I would actually recommend, and I can be the point is to maybe solicit the questions around this so the, and then submit yeah. it. That way you have time to do the analysis and the research and we can then bring this up as a topic for the next, maybe the next agenda on the 27th. Yeah, our point of sharing is simply to leave Absolutely. you with a good feeling yep. that we actually made notable significant gains in building fund balance last yep. year. So this is actually better than you had anticipated, right? Oh. Significantly. When, when, when we were talking and, right. and using and calculating, this is significantly better. Yeah. The other thing we'll do is we'll dissect this and be able to tell you really what the building blocks, where, how do we get that $2 million? Yep. Certainly a chunk of it was excise revenue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and so the other piece is, uh, um, sorry, um, <laughs> I, I like having as much information as possible, but at the same time there is a need, I think, to also consolidate that information into general terms. Um, I'm not saying that this shouldn't be maybe a supplement to, you always have an executive summary and then you have a supplement that gives the better detail. Um, and the reason is that um, this draws a lot of questions and there's just maybe too many, at least too many questions that are running through my head and some of it, it's more I want to, I need, I want to know rather than I need to know. And so, because um, the outcome, like, you, like Peter said, the outcome of 11%, I'm actually kind of, uh, wow, that's, that's a, that explains how good of a year we had. Yeah, we had to, I wasn't sure if we were going to share this, but really to allay fears that I've heard expressed, you know, based on our prior conversation, I'm like, goodness, we're significantly spending down fund balance. Uh, this delivers um, and confirms the fact that we're actually building fund balance back. Um, and that we need to better understand what's happening in the last six months in this current fiscal year. I do have a correction. That line at the very bottom <coughs> that is available for our capital yep. is not really the $2 because we're only supposed to do anything above. Yeah, right, 10%, so it's really closer to about 773,000. Yeah. Just, just one final thing. Tom is, I mean, this is, this is great news. And one thing, you know, it kind of like sort of the continuous improvement process. And, and as, as you guys think about it, we're pretty sure we thought we knew where the numbers were um, when we were doing the budget process. And I think on both sides of the equation, the numbers were much better than we anticipated. And it would be great if, there, if we could just take a look at what sort of things surprised us that delivered that. So the next year, if there's any way to kind of improve the accuracy of, of where it is, because that is such a critical number. I mean, with these types of numbers, it would have had a, a big impact on the conversations and what we did and some of the, some of the community <coughs> dialogue. So any learnings we can have to try to fine tune both sides of the numbers for the reserves would be really helpful, whatever that may be. Uh, and I, I guess my my approach is, um, while I, I think the fund balance numbers are, are critical and they do form a big basis for the discussion, to me it's a question of when when we utilize those those funds and how. Um, I think if we if we try and you know my concern would be trying to uh, anticipate what a future fund might be based on historical information and then something happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we end up realizing that loss and not having a, a cushion for it. Um, I think we really need to look at how we implement that funds. I don't think the money goes away if mm -hmm. it's in the fund. We, it's just a question of when we utilize it and then how we utilize it. So, so from my perspective, I mean, predicting, predicting some of the things that are surprises, uh, it, it's good. If they, re, if they continue to be, if those same things continue to be surprises, then they're not really surprises anymore. Then we can plan right. for that. Right. But if it's always something new or something different right. and that's kind of the catch-all, right. Um, and that's our cushion for future years. I think that's good information to have as well. One of the yeah. things we did with our uh, with the town's school development impact ordinance was that they said we're not going to use the next year's revenues. We're only going to use two years forward revenues. So that that middle first. So the first year you get your revenue. The second year you don't do anything. The third year you're using that first mm -hmm. year's revenue. So you, right. you you don't have to get. You know, right. what the right. Right. So, right. and that might be something we could do with well, this well, too. But the policy is your guidepost too. I mean, you've right. got a policy that, that makes some of those decisions for you. Uh, an example of us learning last fiscal year that ended June 30, the surprise was excise tax. It was a function, right. of, I think, of a improving economy. Um, right. Right. It right. far exceeded our budget expectations. We learned from that. In fact, we accelerated, and in the current fiscal job. year, yeah. 
yeah. we we uh, raised our sights a bit. Uh, so that's a way of uh, revenue is easy as you approach the end of the fiscal year. Sure. The expenditure challenges when Ruth or Kate is asked how we're going to end, they're always kind of um, tentative in terms of answering that question. It will likely be conservative most of the time. Yeah. You know, to add on, to combine the two, these two comments, um, <coughs> this is a great starting point for a fund balance policy review yeah. because I think that just as we did with the capital planning policy, this becomes really the data set on how we can better understand what fund balance, not only what it is and where it comes from, but how it can be used or how it can be allocated and then making major policy decisions that go forward that maybe change how we rely on that balance. Um, because there's other pieces to that. I mean, this is just one factor that goes into the expenditure. I mean, you also have to look at expenditures, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and there's just different pieces to it. So I, I can tell you, I, I'm putting as a note that maybe that we look at the fund balance policy and do it as a review, mm -hmm. using this as a, maybe the data <coughs> set point for that analysis. And uh, this is good. I like item for a future meeting is meeting with our financial advisor. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He was very involved in setting that current policy and giving us the advice, so he could certainly offer some comments yeah. in that regard too. It's good. So we'll bring this back up for sure. Um, any other, um, outside of the fund balance analysis, uh, we really weren't going to talk about. Um, <laughs> any other questions regarding the financial <laughs> statements for the uh, December 31st? The only thing we'll say is that uh, plumbing, building, electrical, all permits are, are really on a great trajectory. They're well ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, again, probably a sign of uh, the economy. Yep. Yeah. And we even bumped those up slightly this year, so we're exceeding those expectations. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to track it, but it's good news. Sure. So I just one, if I could just ask the last question, um, <clears throat> and this is really looking at the year-to-date revenues. Um, which page this is the third, third to last page, page I think. Um, I noticed the only revenue that we adjusted was in fact the taxes. That, if I'm reading this correctly, we went from an original estimate of 25 million, uh, it's line item 90, under 1100 general fund. You see where I'm looking? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just curious to know what, uh, and I'm sure it was a, uh, a committee decision or something, how did we determine to adjust that number down and <coughs> nothing else, nothing else was, everything else seems to be really spot on from what we originally estimated? The council uh, approved the second reading of the budget. Mm -hmm. And after the various votes and things, the council made a decision to reduce the municipal budget by 180,000. Hopefully that's what that equals. Um, and because the council had already approved a budget, this becomes the budget essentially amendment. So I gotcha. okay. The offsets should show in the expenditure side of things, which is kind of difficult because under the revised budget are also uh, prior year income ranks. So. Gotcha. Okay. I knew there was an easy explanation. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, Moving forward, Tom, can I ask mm -hmm. a favor just as a sign note? Um, could we get copies of this for the next uh, town council meeting? It will be part of the finance report. Sure. Of the uh, fund balance? No, this. Oh, finance, finance report. report. Yes, yeah. certainly. And fund balance can be later after we bring we'll it up. We'll try and have the information on the, the, the balance sheet account and what yep. accounts for some of those differences, too. Tom, you and I can talk on that, too. Sure. Later. Great. Moving on to the next item is a discussion and an update on the audit services RFP that we had initiated last year. Yeah, um, we've uh, actually, uh, the Finance Committee approved this September last fall. So um, it's really coming back to you. We're, we're ready for this to hit the streets. We've uh, made a couple of modifications, including asking for pricing for a earlier date for delivery. Uh, I believe we're asking for an October 31st and or uh, November 30th date. I must admit, that early in the fall really puts pressure all the way around. Um, Chances are there won't be savings. It'll cost the town money because they'll be yeah. doing more of the work. So I was just noticing that. And we'll I, that was one of my questions about the savings, about it being earlier. Right. I, I, yeah, I think that's going to cost more then because they would, be re they would take on more of the responsibilities. When is it, when has it been historically delivered? Around December? December 16th or something? It's normally delivered towards the end of December, which yeah. is the town some policy, I don't know if it's the ch I think it's charter. Or, um, the past few years we've had some issues where in, we had changeover 
in the collections office this year we've had some staff out with some um, uh, family medical issues so you know everything we're, we're kind of at a point where we can do the job as long as we have the staff the minute one person is out everything kind of goes so yeah so. Like, it's, it's certainly um, it's the first few years our target and, and we're usually pretty close to that um, the and governmental kind of, uh, the GFOA which is who gives us our award for issuing the CAFR is also required the December 30th 31st date and um, these last few years we've been able to get an extension from them they pretty much say that they're not going to keep doing it so you know we hopefully we'll get some staff who are going to stay here mm -hmm. for a while and, and we'll be able to we are talking about the uh, to the auditor about scheduling their presentation the audit presentation usually a joint meeting of the school board and the uh, town council mm -hmm. do it at the same time so just for an overview this is um, we should probably forward this to the council for full approval do we need to based on term no, I'm or a purchasing agent um, I, I don't believe you need to I think your task as a committee to evaluate this and which you have and then I think it's an administrative function to go through the RFP process and make a final selection okay I'll certainly advise them of the results sure um, will you just actually the will you just will you just verify based on uh, and the reason is that um, charter of course dictates um, over policy whether or not it's because uh, I I just want to say the council. You're right. Uh, for audit services, the council makes the appointment. So right. if you would feel more comfortable that I pass this by them first, I can. Um, um, my thought would be to, to deliver the results and recommendation to the council and have them act all at the same time. Sure. So um, if I could get a copy of this for the uh, finance report, mm -hmm. that could be part of the finance report as an information. Absolutely. Um, yep. So um, the next, if you, we could take the word draft off for the next one, yep. right? Okay. And we did already approve it. And, and uh, unless somebody, ha I probably will change the wording in, under page five, section I, where it says outline any savings to the town. I might say just outline any um, savings or costs or something to that additional yep. cost or something so that you know, you there will be savings. savings. Yeah, we may want to just leave it and see what they see what they do. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's an RFP, not a policy. There you go. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> we don't want people not bidding for that. So if we could have that, that would be great. Yep. Questions I will make questions or comments. Uh, just a just a quick question. This is I know it's a two-year contract. Three. Three. Is it the year ending June 16th through June 18? Okay, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. Um, is this uh, every three years we have to reevaluate, or is there something? I don't think there's. I'm not aware of anything that's causing us to to force us to do it now. Yeah. We the last one we did um, said I think three years. Okay. It's a couple of years extension, and uh, we went. It's been a while, hasn't it, since we've done this? Been five years with them. We've ex had two one-year extensions with the current firm. So, yeah. I mean, part of it, Chris, we just kind of thought, <clears throat> as a finance committee, just due diligence. Sure. They check the marketplace, make sure yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah. getting. And I, I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of any issues with, with the current auditor, but I'm, you know, not no, from I, our side. Me, I don't have the policy, but the town council has a policy that tasks the finance committee with uh, doing some periodic evaluation of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall the time timeline. Um, and that's why it's in front of you. Yeah. Tommy, I just two quick questions about it, and it, <clears throat> it's probably in there. But one thing we talked about, or it, what I'd love to see, is one. We talked a little bit. You know, we've talked a lot about benchmarking. So I don't know. I noticed there was some language in here, but it would be great if you know we ask the potential bidders what they might be able to do to identify some benchmarks for us or recommend some benchmarks. I mean, it sort of builds on the conversation we've already had today. That would be one. And two, a lot of times, and I think it's somewhat, although when I attended last year, but whether they'd be willing to spend a little bit of time sharing with us best practices. So I know they're here to audit what we do, but it'd be really great if they did sort of just a, you know, a 30,000 mile view of, of best practices or something for us maybe to think about and, and to... Yeah, they and don't I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't remember them doing that last year. They may no, have. but they do a management but, letter which yeah. points out any failures or right, weaknesses failures, in our system but, yeah. or weaknesses. And, yeah. and thankfully, we don't have, at least during my time here, not, not that I'm responsible for it. But um, they're usually creative or constructive criticisms. You could do this better. So they don't couch it best practices, but that's the way I view many of those recommendations. But, but that could be delivered as part of um, yeah. 
the audit presentation because right. they do provide us with, you know, here's comparison to other peers or at least there's a slight conversation around it. You should do a graphic display. Yeah, some type of graphic display. So outside of just that kind of statistical yeah, approach. Yeah, I mean, the RFP format is perfect for saying, hey, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah, you add. Things. Yeah. I mean, what, what I'm thinking about is the, you know, the, the typical audit reports because they have to follow, you know, the government requirements mm -hmm. and other things are really painful to read. I mean, <laughs> they're really meaningless for yeah. most people. But if they had some town or some client that found a way that they converted that information to an easier to understand format, I'd really like to hear that because that, and that's one of our challenges here is how can we communicate better to our constituents in ways that they can understand. So, I mean, if that fits in there, I'd just love to have, just have them spend five or ten minutes telling us, hey, you may want to talk to X, Y, and Z. The um, Government Finance Officers Association has uh, a bunch of different types of things they call best practices. Some of them have to do with debt policies, investment policies, budget policies, things like that. So they, uh, that governing body does have uh, a list of best practices. The auditors probably could speak to that a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, when we try to put our policies together, we, we pull from there. those. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually their model we start with. Yeah. I, I, think I'm t I think I'm thinking too more of, you know, what do other municipalities do to, to communicate? How do they present it? What do they do with the information so that it becomes a livable document? So. I, I can, Im I, just from my perspective, I can imagine that anybody will do anything with the right amount of time and money. Um, yep. My concern would be that if we put too much into the RFP that it will skew our pricing, let's say. Well, so we, I'm wondering if you could do like an optional thing yeah, or like a, we do a la carte kind of thing. Or yeah, and understand okay. if, if they're willing and able to provide these kind of value added and if so, is there an extra cost associated and then yep. we can make uh, a decision. Okay. So we can add something to the, to the end of that and uh, see what to come up with. Mm -hmm. Once we have the responses back, we can certainly share them with the committee and you can really dive into and it would be great to have a recommendation to the council. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the very least, and um, it becomes a starting point for the conversation. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to contract for those services. It just gives us an idea if we, since, we, since we, when you compare the need for a budget analyst to provide this type of analysis and even, you know, whatever level you might talk about, it's at least it's a comparative point to that type of a decision, mm -hmm. and in I, my mind. I agree. I think that's fair. I mean, I think we've all we've yeah. all kind of looked at the need to have that best practice. I just don't want it to skew our accounting costs or our auditing costs because yeah. it's it's extra value or extra services or extra scope we're adding. I, I think if they're qualified to do it and we want to look at contracting to do that, absolutely. I think that's great. I just don't want to kind of throw it all into one cart and say, you know, now our accounting fees went from right. X to Y. And everybody goes, why did that happen? Well, we've added all these extra services into the into the contract, so we'll get separate pricing so you okay. can yeah. evaluate. Although, I mean, I, I kind of sat. I, believe it or not, I was in a CPA firm for a couple of years. It gets pretty competitive for clients. I, 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 I mean, if, if I you've got if, if some if one of these organizations have just lost a big client, mm -hmm. they really want to replace that revenue quickly. So sure. a lot of times to get the business, sometimes they sweeten the pot without necessarily. Driving the cost, sure. you're saying. Sure. So sure. if they put it out there, then sure. you know you kind of put the bait out. Yeah, never hurts. No, never hurts. Never hurts. Okay. And I think that's what the current firm did, because their pricing was so much lower than yeah. the yeah. other. It, it 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 depends on where they are in their revenue cycle. If they've got partners looking for sales. The the one firm, uh, Runyon Kirsten Willett, had at that time point in time had the most municipal clients. And they were able to provide because they had all their all those yeah. clients. Yeah, they were able to provide you know yeah. data for all of their clients, and we could see where we were with those other yep. clients. Uh, the current auditing firm at that time didn't have as much. I don't know if they it, you know I haven't asked them where their client base is now, but hmm. uh, yeah, that, that'd be interesting, Tom. I don't know how you're selecting who it goes to, but I think there is, and I don't know who it is. I think others maybe know, but there, there is some firm that does a lot of the municipalities, so hopefully they, there's sort of that built-in learning curve and benchmarking that may be at least worth an invitation for them to come to the table. Well, I think oh, yeah. you can go to the main government website and look at the yeah. individual audit reports. It lists on the far column which accounting firm is doing the audits for each individual municipality. So yeah. It's, pretty it's in our best interest. We'll shut this in the rooftops. We yeah. want as many <laughs> qualified firms as yeah. possible to respond. So yeah. maybe we'll Leave, leave we, no stone unturned. There, there aren't a lot out there that do 
municipal audit. So it, it that's going to limit the pot. Yeah. It'll It'll be had a four or five. Went, yeah. yeah. Four or five ones. And then it's, you know, I think there's one in New Hampshire that's pretty hungry for Maine work, mm. but we have Maine clients, yeah, Maine yeah. businesses too, so, yep. you yep. know, that, yep. that'll yep. play into it. Good. Thank you. That's great. Good. Excellent. Moving on to the next item, which is item number seven, update on the capital budget policy. Um, there's really two parts to this. One is to move this to the next council meeting for action because we are asking the council to approve. Um, I believe it was a unanimous, unanimous vote in recommending that. Um, the second piece is, so Tom, if we could have that as an action item for the next council meeting. Um, talk to uh, Chairman Donovan about that. And I will too. Um, the second piece, though, was that uh, we had talked about an analysis, a supplemental analysis, more for informational, to see what was the impact of this decision if it had been applied to the prior year's budget. Um, and I don't remember if it was solely in relationship to the town's budget or if it was both town and school. Um, so I, I'm not sure if you're ready to give that analysis, but, um, but or to share it. it. It's, uh, it's not complete. Okay. What, one thought we had, and. and you may not like this. Um, one thing we could do as opposed to taking this to council and having the council approve it, I think we all acknowledge that we need some experience and we might need to modify this. Uh, we could keep it in the current holding pattern. So it's approved by this committee. We could use it. We'll, we'll use it as gospel uh, as we prepare this next capital budget. And then uh, we can modify it if we have any issues as opposed to bringing it to council and then maybe having to bring a set of revisions back as soon as this summer. Part of the That's another option. Sorry. Part of the problem I had in, in trying to take the current year budget and apply it to here was there were a lot of questions that I didn't have the answers to. And based on what we have in this policy, we we would have appropriated a lot more. We, we would have or would not have? Would have. And we would have bonded a lot less. So, you know, that makes it, I'm not quite sure what. So, so I'm not sure if, if our <coughs> policy needs to be tweaked because what we did in the capital for this year is really what we wanted to do, or or do we need to tweak how we're actually putting together our capital <coughs> budget? Well, I, I think, I mean, that's a great point because I think that was part of the concern in thinking about it. Are we bonding and capitalizing things that are more operational? And mm -hmm. um, So it's interesting. You know, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, that's, that's sort of where we yeah. thought it might shake out. Yeah. So it's probably worth talking about that. And then I did you use the number because I noticed there's some numbers missing on some of the thresholds in this this draft. Do we still need to fill those? Is that what you use these 100,000 kind of? I think I was using 100,000. Yeah. I know there's yeah, one item we in red there. I thought we agreed yep. to that. Yeah. That. Yeah, re remember that um, there's, a, there's a decision to be made whether it should exist in the capital budget or the operating budget, and then there's a, another question as to regardless of, well, it's in operating its appropriations right. um, or grant, depending on the circumstance. Uh, but capital, we historically have used four or five or six different funding sources mm -hmm. depending on the type of product. And so for me, the, there's two parts to that conversation. Um, I think there's certain circumstances, certainly high dollar value items, I would prefer keeping in capital if, um, so long as they're kind of not reoccurring uh, because those high dollar values, they, they can really skew a budget if it's a project that goes away next year and you have it embedded in your operating budget or it comes online in a given year, it can really fluctuate and it's hard for year to year comparative analysis. Um, like a ladder truck, for example. If we put that in the operating budget, that would show the fire department $900,000 this year and then. Right. But there's also things like plow trucks, we're buying one a year, or school buses, we're buying two or three a year, whatever it is, uh, the tech refresh. That's, that's something we're spending every year, though it may change the, you know, the, how it's being used, but it's the uh, same order of magnitude, more or less, every year. Right. Uh, those are. So, if I can just. If, um, I want to say this the right way. So I guess I need to understand better the imp this report first to understand what the impact is before we get too far into um, the <coughs> overall policy directive. Um, and the reason is because for me there's a common sense approach that says that a ladder truck would not be something that you would put into an operational budget. One, it's not less than $100,000. Um, but there are certain items such as tasers and warranties that you would 
probably not fund in a, I mean, it's $7,200, so there's the, the, the two extremes. So I, I first want to know what the impact is of the, of the policy that we currently have and have approved, um, and then go from there and determine. I do like the approach of maybe using this year, if the, if the Finance Committee <coughs> agrees, use this year as the pilot, if you want to call it that, um, and just use it as a footnote and as a part of our evaluation and recommendation to the full council what that budget is and what the impact is. Because maybe that's the time that we say we also submit the policy to the, to the board, uh, to the council, for its approval and here's the impact in this year's budget as a result of that. So maybe this is the pilot year that we have it and we'll wait to, do you see what I'm kind of? Uh, yeah. If everyone agrees, I think that would be a great approach. I, I, too. I just don't want to go into um, specifics of what's in the analysis until I understand what's in the analysis because there's a lot of information that um, personally at my age, I'm gonna need a magnifying glass. I can't Even with new glasses, I can't read that. I mean, some of that, because I was really looking for a one pager and said, here's your total numbers for the town, right. broken down by the five major groups that we've kind of used in the budget process. Not necessarily the, the little pieces, although this, this is nice to know versus need to know. So, uh, so can you explain this report? If we look at the capital equipment, for example, that's the one that starts with $85,000 extra extrication fire department tool upgrade. Page one. Page, oh yeah, it page one, okay. Well, yeah. yeah, page one, okay. Um, I gotta start using these. <laughs> the column that says greater than $100,000, most of them say no. Based on this, all of those got, uh, lines yep. that have a little B next to them would have been appropriated. Yep. Or we would have had other funding sources. The M stands for its mixed funding, whatever that is. Okay. What's B, bonding? Mm -hmm. B is bonding, A is appropriation, L is leasing. Um, okay. But then the next column talks about is it greater than five years useful life and, and, and most of those are yes. And then... All of them. All of them, yeah. So in this analysis, <coughs> the overview is $693,000 would have continued to be bonded. However, the, rem it's the, uh -huh. B, the B total at the bottom says $693,000 would have been bonded. Mm -hmm. Really, we wouldn't have bonded. We would not have bonded them. Correct. Right. The only one we might have done would have been in the plow truck for 180000 But then again, it's yep. reoccurring. Reoccurring. So. Yeah, so that kind of brings up my question looking at this proposal. Um, I noticed vehicle replacement was mentioned. Um, to me, that would be a very large impact on the schools. I assume they would be under the same fiscal policy as the town. We've right? asked them to consider it, yes. Okay. So I'd, I, to me, I, would, I'd, I think that's going to be a, a great impact on their operating budget because if you're talking at one or two or three units a year at, you know, what a school bus runs, 100,000. 300. 300. Three, yeah. Really. yeah. So, so that's a big jump in their operating budget. So I, I'd like us to be aware of that impact as well because I think that might, that, that might uh, really change our approach to the school budgeting perspective of things. You see what I'm saying? Because now our, their budget's going to jump 300,000. Their operating budget's going to jump 300,000. Then that becomes a question of... And that's voter. exactly the reason we've not been able to transition through the years, is that right. no one's wi been willing to take that hit. Yeah. 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 Right. So but maybe... The transition, right. yeah. you know, the, the out years... It, and the school it's actually there. did transition it over to the operating, but then with the budget adjustments and things, it's now back under... Um, right. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering if this is this is maybe a good topic also for the joint discussions as well. I mean, I, yes. um, well, it seems to me if it's going to really impact, have a big impact on their op potential big impact on their operating budget. It, well, I, th I think it's a terrific idea to use this upcoming budget year yep. uh, as the as the true example, and you can be fully involved. Mm -hmm. um, when I see the CIP request, mm -hmm. we can bring these matters to you and say this is what it means mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. a financial point of view and will have uh, the benefit of working directly with staff and be able to answer these questions a little better because we'll quiz them. Um, <laughs> in fact, we'll probably send out a questionnaire when you submit your CFP request, answer these questions. So Ruth isn't wondering whether something lasts more than five years or so on and right. so forth. Yeah. So was the school asked to, per to participate in this and they just chose not to? or um, We did. I forwarded the, the policy to Kate and uh, the superintendent um, my hope would be that both boards would adopt the, the policy. Well, you know, okay. that, because then we're all 
we're all working from the same uh, playbook, if you will. Because we can't impose that. We've asked for right. it, and we think it makes perfect sense that we're all playing off the, or working off the same policy. Well, but it is the council's purview to approve the capital improvements budget for the school board. Well, I mean, we're kinder and gentler. We, we would like right. them to see the merits <laughs> and that they approve it. Yeah. And, and well, I'm just saying, if we're going to if we're going to apply it to one, it is fair that you apply it to to right. the town. Right. I mean, well, and, and, and we need to understand though before we yeah. do that what that impact's going to be. Yeah, correct. So. Yeah. So uh, two pieces, just as a refresher, Peter, you can correct me and add. Um, we actually did discuss that approach for both groups, and I think that we, uh, the, we being the previous committee, um, and the, initi uh, the initial conversation was let's apply this to the town side to see how it works, and then we will, through the joint committee process, um, see if there is um, you know, dual leadership that can lead this through but on, the other side is, on the other side of the aisle as well or however you want it on the other side of the table, on the school side, but we didn't want to hold them to it because it, there was no discussion yet. Mm -hmm. right. but, you're, but I agree with you, you're 100% right, because where we approve the capital, well, we approve both budgets. Right. You can sit there and say, well, uh, no. The, the one question I will have, though, is that um, I do want to understand how it impacts any state funding, which is going to be an issue I think we're going to bring up later, because as you increase their budget, it has an impact on the state funding formula as well. So there's a little bit more sensitivity because of their revenue source that brings it into a very deeper conversation. I think that's why we kind of settled and said, let's deal with the town first, see what the impact is, at least on our side, incrementally, and then deal with the bigger picture. So yeah, I once that, we get there. The school administration is very receptive to the concept. Yeah, I think they they're just uh, aware of it has potential sure. consequences. But if we budget. ask them to use this policy okay. as they put together their capital, then some of those questions might uh, fall out of as they're doing it. And that might help with the tweaking of it uh, yeah. later on. Yeah, I think I'll send out instructions to my senior sure. staff, and I'll send it to the school as well, saying um, <coughs> kind of a questionnaire along with their CIP request, yeah. fill in some additional information, so then we can yeah. uh, do some further analysis. So, to me, I think that's well. Sorry, I think that's fair. That I think that's fair. We bring that up in the joint, whether yeah. it's tomorrow or some other time, and say, look, this is this is our goal. This is what we're trying to do. Your participation is greatly appreciated. And I mean, I. I Again, I, I, of course, there's going to be an, impl a, a, an implication and a consequence to whatever we do. It's yeah. just we need to have that informed decision making first. So we're all on right. a, a board on board with what it's going to mean and how it's going to play out. So we have a pretty heavy agenda tomorrow for the joint session. <coughs> so I won't bring this up for tomorrow, but we'll definitely I'll talk with the chair of the finance yeah. school boards and we'll put it as a future agenda item for them as well. Yeah. Um, so if you can continue on this analysis um, and. Um, even if it's, uh, you know, I'm okay with just, I just want to see what the impact is on the town. I can exponentially kind of guess what it would be on the other side as well. I mean, it's pretty systemic. Um, the one piece I do want to say, at least for the counselors, is that, by the way, this isn't the first time that the town has tried to transition um, bonded expenses into the operating budget. Um, I mean, um, Robert Mitchell, who was on the school board, championed that for certain expenses for many, many years. Um, and then as soon as he left and change in leadership and change in dynamics, it was not taken up and again, and it kind of fell off the wayside for whatever needs that were necessary at the time. Um, I just hope my goal with any <coughs> policy, though, is that um, rather than just simply abandoning a practice, that you go back to the policy that created the practice, that you then refine that policy so that you continue so that the citizens don't have those volatilities and the expectations of what's going on get changed. That's what, you know. You shouldn't automatically just stop all of a sudden. If it was good enough to be practiced when one person was serving, it should be something that's good enough to hopefully carry on unless it's truly harmful, which I don't believe it was. But I just, to me, it's a waste of time if, we're gonna, if I know in two years you're going to cancel it and not do it again. Yeah, no, I, I mean, again, I, I right. agree. I think we, if we're, we're either, I think we need to adopt it collectively or, yeah. or look at another approach. Maybe. Do we want to, on page two, come up with some numbers for the capital improvement project and capital equipment on um, the policy. Are the policy page two? Policy yeah. page two. Yeah. I thought the, um, my notes had it, everything was 100,000, 100, wasn't it? I can't remember if we, I can't remember if we. I'd have to well, go back to my other draft. <coughs> I thought we all. I thought we. Had <coughs> I think. I think we. I think we were there. Well, I think the charter is four hundred thousand. Is that correct? 
that it's going to go to referendum. Voter approval. That's voter approval. That's voter approval, right. right. So do we want to lower that bar? Or? So voter approval doesn't ma it doesn't um, has no um, consideration for how you fund it. So whether you fund it through the tax base or you fund it, fund it through <laughs> bonding, if it's greater than four hundred thousand dollars, then it has to go to the voters. This has to do oh, with right. how it's funded. Well, it, it's actually four hundred thousand dollars in indebtedness. So if you had right. saved and you had a reserve account and wanted to spend four hundred, you don't need voter approval. It's four hundred thousand dollars in indebtedness. I have to go back. It's in the policy. Yeah. I thought it was four hundred thousand dollars even for a general expense. <clears throat> no. So page four. Yeah, issuance of general obligation securities. Yeah, so it's in on the page principal, four, right? In the principal amount of four hundred thousand dollars for a single capital project. It's probably not important. I'm just drawing a distinction. Oh. It, it is indebtedness, not spending reserves. Oh, that. Oh, the capital improvement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that I mean, again, that's that my only reason for suggesting that it was: just, do we want triggers below that, or do we want this to be? The justification for the bonding issue. You, you know, you follow what I'm saying? Well, I, I think part of the rationale when we started this process, I think, is that to, you know, as as a corporate get get the things in the right bucket. Are, are they more operational than they are capital? And two, the problem becomes when it goes into the debt service, and people don't really see it. It's kind of invisible. They don't really so from the spirit of transparency and understanding what they're voting on. So I think that part of it was just trying to get a consistent policy. So if we're going to use, we, we settled on 100,000 for, you used 100,000 for long-term borrowing? Is that yes, the in short term? In short term. It's the last two bullets on page three in the first. I mean, a, a suggestion might be, <clears throat> you know, and I, I think that's where we were, Sean, is using 100. And if we're going to do it, especially if we're going to do this as a pilot and kind of a learning experience of where does it trigger, what does it do, what, what sort of issues come up, that might be a good place to start and just see, see where it takes I, us. I guess I would ask staff, I mean, do you have a, is there a, a number that would be more cumbersome or less cumbersome? We did a tank three re-chassis, which is going to cost approximately $75,000, which we were bonding. If we have 100000 here, that means that would have been Which will serve us for, uh, say, 15 years right. comfortably into the future. It, it's based on risk analysis and just common sense, uh, that threshold will kick out a, a lot. And maybe that's the intent. Well, and this gets into the conversation around debt. Right. <laughs> Our debt ratio and, and the conversations about whether that's excessive or right or too low. Um, I, I just remember, if the, if, so these are definitions that impact an understanding of the policy. If the policy is set at 100,000, to me, the definition should be set at 100,000. Otherwise, you should change the policy to match your definitions, the impact. Again, I, I personally, professionally don't see a problem with having smaller value items in capital. Okay. But again, so long as their funding source is, could be appropriation or grant. It, it doesn't have to be borrowed if, just because it's in capital. I think that's a misconception that uh, right. uh, we're bonding everything and we're bonding it for 20 years. No. Even things that we're bonding will make a, uh, an evaluation and bond for only no longer than its useful life. Sometimes it's a two or three year No. And do leases also fall under this as well? Yes. So again, that's another issue altogether too, right? I mean, because if, you if you're leasing copiers and you're, it's in CIP, but we're paying for it without bonds, I mean, it's, to me, it's kind of, if you're going to be hard and fast about a number, I, I guess where do you take that discretion out of, of you, you, know, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to relate what I was trying to explain, if you go to the definition of capital equipment, it's a major expenditure used to expand or improve a government's equipment, including vehicles, technology, building equipment with estimated costs in excess of blank. Mm -hmm. If you go to... Next the next page on three, the second to the last bullet. For long-term borrowing, the equipment or project is an item that is purchased and or constructed and frequently has a life expected, I'm not going to read that, in excess of $100,000. But that's if you want to bond it. Right. But it doesn't mean it can't be an equipment. 
For less than that. Right, but you're defining it. This is not telling so you how you're going to fund it. But well, it's a definition of what is right. capital. So equipment. it could be less than the hundred thousand. Is what I'm saying. Because right. we might not bond it on the on the. So service. if the goal if the goal is to reduce our bonding and re and reduce what we bond or or what goes to bonding, then I think that that explanation to me on page three is very is pretty clear. So you could, in your definitions, just remove. The clause that says within um, um, with an estimated cost in excess of you could just put period, but rather have a multiple year life period, because that by definition is a capital improvement process. It doesn't it doesn't matter how you fund it. By na by definition, that's what a capital improvement project is. Then you further define it on page three of when bonding would kick in and when we wanted to evaluate how we would pay for that. Does that make sense? Listen, yeah, I think that's, that's workable, and again, this is a pilot project. We can do it, and, right. and, and we'll point out and talk about if it's problematic. Mm -hmm. So we would just end, for a capital improvement <coughs> project, multi-year life it, period. It's a narrative. It doesn't really have a financial impact. Right. And then for capital right. equipment, just the definition, so drop that last piece off as well. Right, but then you, in page three, I think we're accomplishing what the goal is. And again, I'm looking at you, Peter, to... If, it, if, it is, if it's defining what goes into bonding and what goes, however we, not just capital, because to, to, to staff's point, we could fund capital improvement multiple ways, not just with bonding. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of this process was to make sure that we weren't, um, we weren't playing budget games by right. moving things that are more operational, things that you'd expect to do every year. Mm -hmm and move them off into capital because it's a different approval process that's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And, and, the, you know, and I think in the past there may be times <coughs> when that, that was used as a way to get things through, mm -hmm. through budget. So it really was, first threshold is, is it really a capital item or not? And how do we define capital items? And we've got some of the working definitions here. You know, does it have more than a year's life and that type of thing? Sure. So I think, I think the first goal was just trying to make some clear definitions of what our capital versus what are operational and, and what do we want to think about and use those. So that's the first filter. Mm -hmm. Then the second filter, I think, is some of the other conversations we're having. Then do you put things around bonding or not bonding or that type of thing. But, but, but and again, I guess to Ruth's point, you know, a $75,000 chassis rebuild is a one-time expenditure that is technically a capital improvement because it's a one-time issue, right. but it may not be bonded. It may be done with cash flow or something, but it's still, by definition, a capital improvement project. Right. I think it's a, right. that example. It's a very worthy project for That's bonding right. oh, given sure. its, its longevity. Yeah. In fact, so, if I wasn't, didn't we start the conversation? I was asking for the in that definition on page two. They were going to be a lot lower. We were thinking it was going to be lower. Like fifty thousand. If I remember right, it was going to be like fifty thousand. We've gone all around on it. It's I mean, hard to. It, that's the. That's the. The question really is. Right. I mean, uh, if you looked on the. This other sheet that says capital five year project five year mm -hmm. <laughs> cut off. The first item on it, this is supposed to be the capital improvement. These are the major big buck items. First thing on it is the carpet replacement for five thousand dollars. So it's not really and, and I can see why it was put here because it doesn't really fit under capital equipment because right. it's not equipment. But it really doesn't belong here either. Yeah. You know. I mean if you look at this list or something, so I mean what well, we might want to tease out something like, you know, power supply for batteries. You know, is that really a, a capital item or an operational item? I mean, I mean, that those are things I think, the, you know, the policy was trying to tease out. Mm -hmm. And carpet, is that, is carpet replacement a capital improvement or just ongoing? So that would be it? part of the capital improvement equipment. Sorry, capital equipment, correct? I guess that there's two. Forget the, forget the balance amount. Yeah. Under, based on <coughs> Councilor Chiazzo's recommendation, if there's no value in that, that would be called a capital equipment. How do you right. fund it? Is secondary to it. Correct. Right. That's right. I have a I have I personal issue with capital equipment because to me the capital equipment budget should be really the small things that are big enough to affect a budget, operating budget, but not big enough to be more than a year. But I don't know what to call it besides capital equipment. Mm -hmm. Because I would have put the, the carpet here if I were gonna put it anywhere. But under your definition, I think that's what we're trying to tease out, would be Something that doesn't last a year shouldn't be in capital at all. I mean, it, that's an operational expense. Right. Well, hopefully, you if should. we put in a new rug, it's going to last. Well, the only <laughs> value of getting it out, it, it could be, 
it is to smooth out the the peaks and valleys. I mean, yeah. some of these things, the big ticket things, can have an, a, 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 they're an anomaly and they have an effect in a given budget year. So it makes sense to so you can compare year to year. We don't have these right. big swings. I mean, I think every year you've got consumables, for lack of a better word, that are annual costs that are regular. Right. Um, to me, again, from from the I sell capital equipment, so for me, a capital expenditure is a piece of equipment, a right. physical thing that has long-term value right. to it. Right. How you finance that, that that's, that's a different issue. That's a different issue, right. right. So if I'm looking at, at, for the sake of back to the definition purposes, to me, it's, it's putting a dollar value on capital equipment. I mean, technically, you could, you know, you could call pens a capital expenditure if you bought three million of them. <laughs> You know, um, does that mean that it's a piece of major equipment? No, but it's by definition, it's a material thing that's going to last more than right. a year, hopefully, right? So I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's I, my concern would be we would get so detailed and we would lock it into a point where we don't have discretion any anymore. And and I and I, I think we can accomplish the goal of being able to evaluate what goes into bonding versus uh, how we're paying for that when the capital budget comes before us. I mean, to me, that's a, because we'll have the opportunity to review that anyway, correct? So we can ask those questions of why, why are there uninterrupted power supplies in here and what's the, how does that fit into the definition of capital? Is that something we should be moving to operational and why? That kind of thing. So I think I, rather than have a, a drop-dead trigger, of yeah. it meets this yes-go, no-go, to me, bring that up, if we're going to be evaluating it, bring that up to be able to say, okay, here's our list of capital, where are some other potential areas in the budget that should be put in and why? And we can have that discussion and, and then tease that out through the year or so. For the policy. For the policy, yeah. right. And then I probably use that as a wrong example, but that carpet replacement for 8000 if you looked at the actual budget document, it's a three-year project. So probably 8000 in that department's budget would have cleared <laughs> the budget for those next three years, and then it would drop off, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't see it for the next 15. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think I tried to make space, like cut things out, but... Um, but what, what you could do, though, in order to flush out, flush out, however you want to look at it, um, is that you would actually separate those capital projects into an individual line item or its own section within the operational budget. That way you can see the fluctuations from year over year and see the trend. That way it's not hidden in the other lines. Right. For each, for each of the departments to have a line that says capital budget. I, uh, you know, because these are definitions and don't have a financial impact necessarily in any analysis, I'm okay if Peter is um, in just taking Chris's recommendation. Mm -hmm. And for both capital improvement projects, you basically end the sentence at multi-year life. Right. And then capital equipment, you would end the statement at, um, you need to insert the word and before building equipment. Yep. Thank you. And then a period after equipment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I make that as a recommendation. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> if, if, yeah. I'll, I'll move. These it. are friendly amendments since we've already approved. Uh, yeah, administrative I, amendments uh, we since we've already approved. We don't need a motion or move or anything. Well, since we're not moving this to the council this year, no, this is guidance. This is guidance. We, guidance. We, we understand. Then we'll approve it again. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll use the real world example of the CIP for fiscal so year 17 and run yeah. it through the CIV yeah. and yeah. come back to you with. And what I did want to ask, and doesn't need to be part of anything right now because it is a definition. I think that there needs to be a definition around operational expenses or operational, everything that's not included in those definitions need to be defined. Like an operational capital kind right. of thing. Because almost in some ways, and I think that's great, because I mean, that your printer example is a great example Absolutely. where yeah. that, that you, know, you know you're going to need that. It's more of right. an operational right. expense. Well, and I, I, you're right. And looking at the again the school side of things, that tech refresh that they do on a regular basis, there's obviously some debate on whether that should be an operational right. or whether that should be capital. Right. I think it resides in capital for the it most does. part right now yeah. um, because it's technically a piece of equipment. But is that the best place for? It? And that's the debate I think we've been having certainly for the three years yeah. since I was there, if not beyond, of where is the best place in the budget for that. Okay. So if we can just for a future on this, so. Um, I do actually, you know what? I, so, what I would like to do is to just be clean on this. Is actually, um, if we can reopen the discussion, and I would move to amend based upon what we just discussed, but then also move to um, 
I don't know if it'd be to table this, but, but um, to act on the, basically that this becomes, I mean, this becomes a pilot for the year, and, and we're not going to send it so that it's reflected in our minutes. So I'm not sure how to kind of word that um, that yeah, I, motion. I, don't know or that. I think we'll I'll work with Colette. I'll make sure that the minutes are clear in that regard. Yeah. Ruth and I understand yeah. that this is guidance given to us that we're going to use sure. fiscal year six seventeen as the real world example. So I just I want to make sure that since we've approved the budget, even though we're reopening and amending this, someone doesn't come forward and say, "Hey, the finance committee approved this; it should be forwarded to the town council as a whole." Now I, I don't know if I need to reopen and just ask to table this. I don't, think I don't want someone to get procedural on me and say, "Well, why haven't you forwarded this?" Under to the committee council? reports, you could yeah. report to the full council okay. the next I just meeting. Want to that we do it right how we're going to handle document it. Documented yeah. in case something happens and we all get struck by lightning, because well. that could happen before we win the Powerball. Before we win, yeah. <laughs> The chances are, <laughs> are, we will. Yeah, it would happen. Yeah. Um, that and get hit by a plane. I'll try and I'll put something in for operation, the operational yeah, portion of it, and so we can have some definition there too. But if the minutes maybe can reflect that the committee has agreed that we're going to implement this as a pilot for the year and then report yeah. out later, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Good conversation. Um, next item is. Um, I'm going to try to get, wrap this up here soon, really quick. And there's so much to do. Um, item number eight: review fiscal year 2017's proposed budget review and adoption schedule. So um, we have this available. It's going to be actually. Um, it has not been approved by this committee, nor has it been approved by the joint committee. Our goal is to actually have it approved by the joint committee. Um, the purpose of presenting it here is to one highlight it so that it's known what we're discussing tomorrow, um, and to give some high points between it. There for me. There are really three points <coughs> to mention. Um, first is that um, you have to use the starting point and the end point, and then there's a lot of things that can happen in between, right? So um, we are expecting to have the town manager and the superintendent provide us with a copy of their budget on April 6th. It will be at 7 p.m. at the town council meeting, um, and that's um, what is considered the first reading. We can have some conversations about um, how and why we classify that as a first reading just so that we can better understand um, the need for that because that initiates the discussion process for us on the formal acceptance according to our charter and policies. Go ahead. Just a good okay. question. No, um, absolutely. We, we talked at one point about is there any chance if that's going to be presented for the first read that at least the committees and the council sees the documents before that so they're not walking in cold to what those numbers are? Yeah. So we're talking about this tomorrow as well. Okay. Um, so this is more of an information, but okay. it's a good question yeah. Yeah. because um, the two chairs, uh, you know, Jody Shea and I, we did talk about that with the managers. Okay. And because um, I knew that that was an issue that was brought yeah. up last okay. year as well, okay. there is, a, believe it or not, there is some time constraints with this because it then requires manager. I mean, it requires really an initiation of the budget two weeks earlier in order to also accomplish everything that we achieved between the first reading and then the second reading because we expanded that, you know, that review process, the number of meetings, public hearings, so forth, so on. So it's going to be a conversation tomorrow, I okay. promise. Great. But we're, Great. we're definitely Great. bringing that up. Good. So that's the start. Um, the second point is to mention is that on uh, May 18th is the expected uh, town council second reading and the budget vote. So that would be the formal process. Um, by the way, this will, of course, as soon as it is approved, will be available online for everyone to see. And we're going to, and I'm going to talk um, later about um, some things around that. And then the last item is on June 14th, is, and that's what really is driving this. June 14th is the big point in which the school budget validation referendum is currently pending or scheduled, which uh, coincides with that is not a flexible and moving date because it coincides with the, um, the primary election. Well, it could be. You could hold a separate one for the school budget. You could, but it doesn't um, make sense. Yeah. When we're talking about the best use of resources, having two separate yeah. uh, voting yeah. days that cost us money. And voter turnout. And voter turnout. highest then, so it makes sense to align it. I'd just like to uh, uh, amend your comments, if I could, and point out another very important date that's. Well, you can add your comments and not amend mine, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, I could do that. <laughs> if that would be more appropriate, I'll wait until the end and I'll add my own. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Go ahead. You forgot the budget form. Oh, I, I apologize. That's, that is correct, which is on April 27th. April 27th. Good and, thing. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Good thing, just I will keep amend my Keep comment. in mind, and this will be talked about tomorrow, but there's a little legend yep. that tells you what colors mean. Yep. You'll note that the joint finance meetings, we schedule two each month for the month of January, February, March, 
April and May, and June for that matter. Now, I think there's a recognition, at least I've heard from uh, committee chairs, uh, that we are likely not to need them all, but for purposes of scheduling, we've got them on the calendar, and I think it's going to be kind of, you'll set your agenda as a joint group, and again, I don't expect you'll need them all. So, um, as we um, develop our agendas for both, uh, for both this meeting as well as for the joint, the conversation around the budget really is a joint process with the school board. So, but it, I think it's really important. I mean, Chris, you're right. April 27th, 7 p.m. is the budget form. It's currently rescheduled for the Scarborough High School. How that is structured and how it's delivered and um, active participation from citizens and interested parties, we'll have that conversation just to kind of go forward and make sure that we can refine anything that uh, might not have worked well, but also reinforce the things that did. So that will be still a focus that we have. Um, so if anybody has any questions later, you're always welcome to uh, get them to the joint committee and bring them up there. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm not really seeking what's going to happen if the intent is to allow the joint committee to first vote on this and make it a joint decision and then bring this back and we'll forward it to the council at the next, uh, I think it's going to be February 3rd, they'll get the full, everybody pretty much knows what it is, but that's when it will be officially approved or sent to the budget, uh, sent to the council. Any questions or comments by you two? Mm -hmm. uh, the council just uh, it's up to the council to approve the, the, the schedule, or is it just uh, an informational um, kind more of informational thing? More informational. More informational. Okay. I mean, uh, it's going to be published so that uh, we can get feedback if there's yeah. significant issues and ideas, because you know um, things can change, right? Sure. Uh, Depends I on when information is shared from the state. We have, we have shared it with uh, Council Chair Donovan uh, in terms of scheduling, and, yep. and I think meet, this meets his approval generally. Excellent. Um, next item. This is just a really more informational um, and to get some feedback around what is being kind of labeled as the 2017 budget target. So um, in speaking with many, let me back that up, actually the phrase back up. Um, we had our, um, what was it called, a working session, our goal setting. We first had kind of like that um, to get to know you. Sorry. Team building. Team building, get to know you, however it wants to be termed. And really there's been somewhat, I, I would say, somewhat of a consensus that we need to have a discussion around the budget. Um, and, th and the reason is that, if you think about it, I mean, we have employees who have a lot of work to do, and while we want to be have an open dialogue and an open conversation, there are boundaries in which we can be creative and have an extensive dialogue, because they do have to get to work and put the numbers together and the timelines very quick. So the goal is um, tomorrow, um, as part of the agenda for tomorrow, um, Jody and I have put on that agenda an opportunity for council, all council members, as well as all school members um, and the committees, to have an open dialogue conversation about where should we try to set this year's budget. The goal of our joint sessions is really to set the framework and the staging for the following year. So that's why we need to at least, pro at least provide some guidance for this year and have that general conversation so that the that the professional staff can get to work in getting the budget because it's a very short window to get all that done, as you can imagine. So um, it's really more of an information by putting it on the agenda. But I would like to, you know, I think we've all talked. Uh, we get two councils here as well, other councils. But you know, I'll take any advice on how that conversation should happen <coughs> tomorrow. But we're all going to be in the same room and we're all friends and I'll have the same goal in mind. So. You don't need to share it in advance. You can. No, I, I will add the, um, the the board has approved their goals already for the year, and there are some some budget ones in there as well. I mean, I know they're separate from ours, but I think uh, you know that that I would imagine that they would come with those parameters as well yeah. for discussion. Yeah, and the reason for that conversation, even in, in its generalities, is that we have some big um, goals. I think in the sense that we want to define metrics that can be used from year over year and then we need to do the research of what that is to be able to then use it knowledgeably in the conversation as well as trying to define certain aspects of budgeting such as what is level services and having that conversation is going to take longer than what is allowed by our current cycle but it will be good information and good direction for next year's budget um, so that's kind of why we're kind of doing this at two different in two different paces so um, any comment Tom any comments that you want to add for that I don't want to be out of turn for any other counselors or... No, there's a, a bit of pressure. It's kind of self-imposed, but yeah. I've talked to no. uh, Mr. Donovan. He would like the council goals to be adopted at your next meeting on the 20th. 
which means tomorrow, um, ideally, the joint group would, would come to co some sort of consensus on a budget target. Uh, the other two are done, as far as I'm aware. I don't think there's kind of any open issues on the other two council goals. It's really the budget goal that needs this, this further refinement, this final piece, if you will. Yeah. So if you could set the expectation that you leave tomorrow's meeting with that target recommendation in hand, that would be great. Yep. And just as an editorial note, there's been a lot of conversation around this, and my advice to you is that you could spend the next six months talking about this, yet we've got some real important work uh, staring at us, and a lot of it was talked about today. So I think the sooner we can kind of set the stake in the ground and, um, and move past that to the real work of the budget, the better is my recommendation. Sure. So, um, and we can have a conversation, I, I, uh, since you brought it up, um, it is coming for the 20th. Is that going to be, sh do you know when we're going to get a copy of those goals? Well, the goals uh, were distributed from the consultant, uh, so there are two, there were three That's in total. That's the document that was, um, okay. And from my review of this and estimation, the two communication related ones seem pretty well locked down. Uh, I'll fine tune them slightly, not put words in your mouth, but the budget one is still a bit open in that regard. And Again, it's, it's self-imposed, oh, but think, I think okay. it does make sense yeah. for the council right. to kind of get this done. Mm -hmm. You know, you made great progress before the year started. Let's not let this linger too much into the budget changes. year or the calendar year. Okay, perfect. Um, any other comments, questions from the? Is, so, uh, sorry, just about the only one really holding us up then is the budget one that's that's kind of preventing the council from. Yeah, one counselor, and I, it might have been Councilor Donovan, you know, added in under action for the budget goal a a percentage. Yeah. Um, all the other action items were kind of didn't have that level of specificity. So I, mm -hmm. I think for all of our purposes, we need to have uh, a readily understood um, budget target so we can all work toward that. Mm -hmm. And I know, I believe it was Councillor Donovan, I know that was offered um, only after some some very thorough understanding of kind of what, what does that mean in practical terms um, to town and school budgets and to tax rates. So, um, so I have a question regarding the highlighted, and I'll pose that to you later. Okay. So my, um, the second bullet, I didn't think that we actually had a numerical value put in there as part of our goals conversation. What, this on the actions? Yeah. Yeah, that's what he just said. He said Councilor uh, Donovan should have That was my right, recollection. That that they were reporting verbatim kind of what was recorded yeah. on the sheets mm -hmm. that night. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, I think right. he put it there, but he said it needs to be a conversation. So yeah. A yeah. Conversation. Yeah. Which so that like conversation is tomorrow. Tomorrow. Right. Um, so, uh, sorry, I get thrown off there for a second in my own head. Um, scary moment. Uh, future <laughs> a little, you know. Uh, future meeting dates and times for us. Established date to meet uh, with BSSN. If you can tell us what that abbreviation is on legal sure. services. Oh, uh, Baron legal. Sure. Sawyer and Nelson. Nelson. Um, if you remember, this was um, our analysis last year, our discussion around legal services. Um, what is the best day of the week that is good for the committee to be able to meet? Um, so that we can schedule that with the attorney. By the way, this is um, purely a financial yes, uh, yeah. finance committee um, um, mm -hmm. review. I think we can invite just about anybody that's on the council. We may want to determine in advance what portion, if any, has to be executive session. If there's any discussion around particular cases uh, for confidentiality purposes, I would think, I'm not a lawyer, but I would think that we would need some confidentiality. Sure. So, Tom, can you plan that for us and maybe... Yeah, I guess the question is, do you want to schedule it with one of your normal monthly meetings or is it something you'd rather do separate? Um, I'm, I think they're flexible with, with some notice to, to attend. Your next meeting is February 10th. And if it helps, we did talk to the financial advisor. He's not available in February, but is uh, very pleased to be here in March, if that helps at all. So we could schedule those two yep. for your next two months. Mm. We'll that work? That if you want. Makes sense. Um, so, just to make sure on the, well, that's actually the last, on the scheduling, I thought our next meeting was January 27th. I'm not aware but of that. only once a month? Or I had it in my calendar twice. The real boss in the back row saying once. Okay. Um. 
I just put it in my calendar on. Whatever she said. We're all smart men when we say that. <laughs> We've scheduled all monthly meetings. Okay, no, that's fine. More frequent, we can talk no, about No, it. no, no. At two, at same time? At four? Four o'clock, same time, yep. So, yes, we can definitely, I think that's perfect for... For February, we can have the legal services conversation and maybe have that at the beginning so that we can just immediately go to the executive Understood. session if we need to. Yep. And then um, on the financial advisor, we can do that in March. That's March 9th. Yep. Great. We'll make those arrangements. So I did want to add, um, only so, and I apologize, I'm horrible on email. Um, so I just saw your recommendation. I would like to suggest that we could have a state presentation on the school funding formula to un better understand it as a committee how that funding formula is um, composed and how it changes um, I, I, over time. I, I, I agree that's always a good a good opportunity to bring people in front and talk to about the magic behind the, <laughs> the, the mirror or the curtain because we'll never figure it out anyway. But right. maybe that's something better for a joint. We bring that up tomorrow because, I mean, obviously that's going to if the school is going to have similar questions, it might be nice to They'll have it all. They'll be equally interested, I'm sure. Yeah. Not more. Right. Okay. So I'll move. I'll move if you're okay. Oh yeah. Um, I just saw it, and I thought it was good. And there was a mention. I think there's a director of uh, finance. finance and school operations at the state level that might be a good resource to bring in, um, and to really talk about that. So we can bring that up tomorrow. I'll move that there. Mm -hmm. um, the other item is that uh, for Council Rowan has done, um, has shared with us, um, or some of us, I think all of us on the council, some analysis that he's done regarding financial statements and particularly our finance uh, with other communities. Uh, Councilor Rowan, you wouldn't mind coming to the table and kind of... Oh, yeah. Is there any way to project onto the screen? That I don't know uh, if they're ready to do that. Well, I, we can. We need to hook you in. Uh, are you doing the presentation now? I guess. Do you want to do it now? I can well, maybe, maybe, um, maybe, can we get an overview? Yeah. And then we can do, maybe put you on for the presentation piece on another one? Uh, we do an overview? I'll be honest, I didn't know that. It's very I didn't, graphical in nature. So uh, they're very graphical? Let's separate one from the other. If we can do it, let's <laughs> do it. I know it sounds wild out there, huh? I, so, thought, I thought so that was a meeting we're having upstairs. I know. <laughs> I didn't realize. There's a lot of wind blowing outside, or is that inside the building? <laughs> <laughs> well, can I? Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, that's what I can talk about. I'm going to have something else. So be, while um, Council Rowan is getting uh, kind of ready to, so, to give kind of a precursor to that and why, um, and I apologize for not having it on there. It came after. So um, Council Rowan, uh, Rowan, sorry has done um, a lot of personal analysis around the town's budget and in comparison to peer grouping. Um, that is um, pretty good insight because as we begin to talk about dashboard reporting, which is really you know setting benchmarks and how do we see the trends, um, some of that trending should also be how do we compare ourselves to other peer groups. And so uh, Councillor Rowan was actually taking the town's budget and compared it um, to other municipalities. and. I just thought it would be nice to share uh, roughly what he's done just so that it kind of gets us thinking about what we want to see in um, our comparisons and our benchmarks and our metrics um, around that. So. Anybody know any good jokes? Any good jokes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So since this is going to be reported behind me, I'm going to go sit over there if you don't mind. Because it's not going to come up. I do a lot of things, but I can't see behind my head. I, I thought it comes up on all. I don't know if he's going to have that open if it's sat down too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what needs to happen. <laughs> I don't. I, I think you're, I think you're plugged in, ready to go. I'm plugged in. I don't have power. Do they have to do something? Oh, a He doesn't have power. Oh, white cord. Not the camera. No, he looked. I the technology is great, it? but no. yeah, I guess uh, I guess the joke is the whole political scene. Right. You right. see what's going on? No, it's got the national I national I national national decide if I'm embarrassed yeah, or if I'm intrigued. Hold it, hold it up. It's entertaining. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, it, it, there's there's certainly a 
hear him on on both sides. Oh, it's funny. There have been some YouTube clips or something about commentators in other so, countries that are just... So I could open tomorrow if we wanted to just... So then I don't get on time. Nah. Yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, first thank you for coming in and doing this. Um, so we're not doing it. No, but we're not. Well, oh, yeah. let's wait and see. Uh. He, he said he doesn't have power. Yeah, no, there's no power to the source. So. I don't know if I. Uh. No, he has, to, he has to plug into the actual source. What do you mean? Right? The wall. He's got, oh, he's got it. Well, there should be a, a connector cord that plugs him into well, the projector. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I don't think it's Wi-Fi. It it no, it's, it's not Wi-Fi. No. Oh, he does have power to that. No. Oh, I got a blue light. Tell me when I have a spotlight in my head and I'll move. See the blue. Really? <laughs> of all people to talk about the glare on my forehead? I don't have a forehead. I have a forehead. <laughs> See, there's the joke, right? <laughs> oh, here we go. See, let's, I'm going to leave. Okay. It's coming. Oh, all right. That is not my screen. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Someone's surfing. Nobody look at that. <laughs> that is proprietary. Not anymore. <laughs> like we all know what it means anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like understanding the financial statement. All right, hold on. Wow. No, not quite there. There we go. And that. Hey, all right. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so the idea was just to, to uh, uh, sorry, Councilor Baywine set me up, uh, just to kind of look at what, how Scarborough is spending its money versus some of the surrounding municipalities. And really all I had to go on to do the comparison were the municipal audits that, uh, uh, Councilor Chiazza mentioned earlier, just from online, I just took the uh, the most recent audits that I could find for um, Scarborough online had the 2014 audit, um, and so I took some surrounding towns. Um, excuse me. So Scarborough online had the 2014 audit, um, and basically in, in the um, it's breaking down a number of areas. Um, it has has um, a general government uh, box, the public services, public safety, public works, um, pub uh, education, and then interest on debt service. And so if you graph it in a pie chart, this is what it looks like. Um, I combined uh, general government and public services because it, it's just other government spending. Um, I believe, as, as Mr. Hall alluded to earlier, uh, to, do a, to do a comparison between towns, is, it's a little crude because we don't have any way to know, for instance, that. Uh, where people put their, their water delivery versus Scarborough, which is included in our public works budget, is my understanding. Um, so then I, uh, uh, this is also important to note that it's looking only at expenses, it's not looking at revenue. So for instance, you know, we have offsetting revenue coming in for, um, uh, for uh, community services, but it, in, in this analysis, that's only shown as an expense. Um, and so I took the, um, the, the, really I was looking at the school districts, um, around the greater Portland area. So there's some towns in here that probably aren't good com comparables, um, but it was just an idea of, um, for instance, Limington and Hollis probably are, are poor uh, comps, but uh, the idea was they kind of fit into that ring around Portland that would include our immediate neighbors on either side of us, um, and then going all the way to the north. Um, and as I mentioned, some towns have different aggregations, but uh, the hope was that this would be close enough for government work just to get it, give us an idea in terms of pennies on the dollar of our, of our income tax, how are we spending? Um, and so what you find is that uh, for public safety, uh, we are, we are um, you know, as, as a comp, we're, we're close to the top. Um, and this is not to pass the judgment to say that, you know, we're spending too much on public safety, it's just an analysis of, of what is. Um, public works. Our interest on debt, this was uh, kind of enlightening. It, it, certainly this was uh, just the interest uh, that was called out, and it's um, we're right at the top. Um, other spending and services were also quite near the top. And then the last one, you have education. You can see that we're we're pretty close to the bottom in terms of uh, pennies on the dollar. So what basically what we're saying is that 50 under 54 cents of the um, of our the money that we spend is spent on education. 
<coughs> and on a com comparative analysis of these times, you can see that that's actually quite low. Um, and so then I just, there were some questions about where does that debt service figure in? The analysis that we could find was that the actual debt service itself was included on, um, for instance, the educational debt was included in the education budget, municipal debt was in the, uh, was in the, the other government spending, and then the interest itself was what was called out. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, one question was, well, well, you know, the subsidy that, that comes from the state is really just revenue, but some of these municipalities are getting quite a bit. So what happens if you actually uh, remove the subsidy? Um, and if you take that out, you can see that we're still pretty close to the bottom. Some, some towns have moved down, but we're still uh, spending just under 51 cents on the dollar, while others are in the 60 plus range. Uh, Uh, so again, I, I'm not trying to imply that it, any negative judgment in terms of how we're spending our, our funds too high or too low, just as a percentage of what we're doing. Uh, but I would conclude that we're, you know, spending, underfunding our education when we're comparing with um, surrounding towns, similar towns with uh, similar and higher median incomes. Um, and so there, there is a public perception that, that uh, we're, you know, the education is a huge driver in our budget and that we are, um, spending an unusually large percentage on education, and so I feel like this is information that we should take publicly. Um, and then I'm also suggesting that, you know, we should really tr strive toward getting toward uh, the middle. Obviously, that's not, a, that's not a shift that we can make rapidly, um, but to, to start to set some kind of goal to, to move toward the middle. Um, and then obviously work with our delegation to try and maximize our, our state subsidy or at least improve predictability. And that's what I have. Just, just a good question. I mean, we've been trying to figure out what, what's a good metric to use to evaluate stuff. It looks like here, you know, you're talking about what is our expenditure of the total, you know, expenditure <coughs> of the town is the metric. I mean, is it, I mean, is that the right metric to be looking at when you say we need to move, or is it? I mean, what's the best, what is a benchmark that we should be looking at that really <coughs> is a way to measure how we're doing on education versus other things? I'm not sure the total expenditure percent is, is the number. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it very well may not be. It, it's, it was just, again, the crude tools that yeah, I had to work yeah. with to do an analysis. That's cool. Just those audits. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and really just the, just the one case of those audits that yeah. summarize those things. Um, so when, when you when you look at that, I mean again, yeah, it's no, it's, it's hard to it's hard to say what that is, but it looks like when when for instance, um, I can't read that from there. But you know, even if Standish is a poor comparable, but but when they are allocating their twelve dollars and fifteen cents of property tax, you know, and they're they're agreeing that excuse me, twelve dollars and fifteen cents per thousand dollars in valuation. You know they're agreeing that 74, per, 74 cents of that is going to go toward education. So it's it's just kind of more of a reflection of um, values in the community. Well, I, I would just point out that I, I think that's that alone can be terribly misleading. In that there are communities on that list, those that show the highest education spending, that offer very few and therefore low cost town services. Yep. And so uh, you're comparing full service communities to certainly not full service communities. So I'd be, I'd be concerned. I'd be cautious in reading too much into that. I think there's a general takeaway that I think Council Rowan's trying to make, but I think there's a lot of reasons for those differences. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> That's why metrics are just so important for us yeah. to finally. Yeah, but again, a lot, of, a lot of the towns on this list are poor, yeah. poor comps. If, um, how do I want to say this? Two pieces. One is that I agree with the manager in that, um, not to be cautious, but to be open-minded. And the reason is because there is a lot of explanation that isn't necessarily in a financial statement. So as an example, when you compare your graph here to the debt service, we don't know what the capitalization, or, I'm sorry, the maintenance rate of other communities as far as um, there could be a, a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance 
that, is, um, that has been not undertaken for many, many years that has either undervalued that community or not properly really placed them within this comparison. Um, this, is gr this is to me um, data like this is a great starting point for the conversation because it does at least provide us with a benchmark to understand where we are. Um, I look at this really, what's great about the data that you presented, Will, is that um, it gets to the higher level which a council should look at about what percentage of the total tax dollar should go towards education versus other services. And that starts the conversation about the value of a community because for every person that says more of that dollar should go towards education, there's one that says it should be less. And it's how do you balance that between the two and this data kind of helps us at least begin that conversation and to then think about the other pieces that go into it such as the deferred maintenance, um, you know, <coughs> community services. A lot of communities don't have a, a robust community services program like we do. You know, so there's a, there's, it's, it's a great foundation to understand and I, I just want to say thanks for looking at that. Um, as I mentioned over a cup of coffee, I think um, your wife should punch you because you obviously have more time on your hand <laughs> to do all this research. <laughs> <laughs> because that's a lot of online research and printing that off and putting it into a spreadsheet. And, um, but I, I just want to say thanks. That's, a, that's a great work um, because it does help us at least have that value conversation. Yeah, so again, my, my two cents, which is going to end up costing about a nickel or a dime because that's usually the way it works. Um, I do think this is a great way to frame the discussion in yeah. terms of even if we are going to discuss whether that 53.76 is a real number. I think it does put us into perspective of choosing any number of groups on that list to see where we, where we stand generally. Um, does that mean that we need to be at 65 or 66 percent using those metrics? I don't think that's what that means. I think that means that we need to really look at our prioritization because if we adopt the measures that we're looking for in our in our budget goals of, of, of uh, as proposed now a three percent limiting our tax increase to three percent, I think that's a very legitimate and real goal to have. But this discussion should not tie the two together of increasing educational spending, whatever that number is, with increased taxes. To me, it's having the discussion around prioritization of, of how we're spending that dollar. And I think in conjunction with our, our, our metrics discussion with the joint sessions, I think we can tie in increases in expenditures or increases in allotment, if you will, or shifting that allotment with measured performance on the school side of things. So if we come up with a metric, let's say it's per pupil spending, if the school decides that's what they want to hang their hat on, we start that analysis and that benchmarking process based on that, that metric and say, okay, here's where we're at, what's your goal? How much will it cost to get to that goal? How are we gonna track progress? Meaning that if we're, instead of just throwing money at it and increasing that number arbitrarily in the hopes that we're gonna get a better school system, I think we, this is a great positioning statement to say, Look, if the school is saying that, they're, that they need more resources and they're making the argument of these are the metrics we want to measure against, we can use this to say, okay, maybe we do need to bump that up, uh, you know, one or two percentages or three percentages. And once we do that, though, the challenge for this group is going to be where do those three cents come from? Because they have to come from some other, we're not, it, we can't spend a dollar and three cents. We have to spend a dollar and we've got to make those hard decisions if that's our goal and that's our priority, we've got to look at other issues of where it's going to come from. So, and I think that's, that's the real difficult discussion is, agree. you know, not, not doing, in my mind, it's not do we need to do it, it's to what extent, how quickly, how, how um, and how do we tie that to a measurable performance? What, what's our return on that investment, I think, to put it in the right, the right frame? So, so I, I think it's a great starting point. I mean, I think no analysis is perfect. I think we're all clear we're struggling as it is now to set metrics across the board. Um, I think this is as, as good of a rough reference as any we're going to get. Um, and I, I think this might help frame our discussions a little bit or help at least put it into perspective when we really start talking about hard numbers with this committee certainly and then with the council moving forward. Peter, any comments? Not to keep my back to you, but <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep the data in front of me too. So. No, but I, but I think 
you know, I think this illustrates, you know, the challenge for all of us is it, it, how do we find that benchmark that really does best correlate to what you're spending versus the value that you're getting? Right. What is that number? Is it this right. number? Is it cost per pupil? Is it some other number? And I think that's, you know, that will be, if we can land on something we're all comfortable saying, this is it. Right. That's great. Um, so it's a start. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's a filter. It's a way to look at it. Sure. But I, I think there's some other things to consider, too. I mean, the thing, the thing that I, the, the conversation that was fascinating to me is last year I did a little research saying, at least, and I, and I could be wrong, but I thought what I read is there is not necessarily a high correlation between what you spend per pupil and outcome. It may have a lot more to do with teacher ratios. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Right. I mean, I, I think we need to spend some time and figure out, just as you suggested, what is the metric we want to measure, and how do we move toward making progress on that? And, and the more data points we have, great. Right. But, I, but I think, as, as pointed out, every data point has sort of pros and cons. We just need to be aware. Well, and, yeah, and again, to, uh, the perspective of my, you know, my approach is that the, you know, for us to determine what those metrics are as a council, you know, much like we're not experts in, in public works or police enforcement, we're really not experts in education either. No, no, Which no, is why no, I think, I, I think the, the real basis of the question of the first discussion is, is this the adequate level of funding for education in this town? And, and I think, um, you know, to your point, there's, there's people that think it's not nearly enough and there are those that think it's still too much. Yeah. So if we can look at those metrics and, and I guess, you know, the whole part of the exercises are building trust. Yeah. So if we if we can listen to what the school department is saying and say okay you picked you you picked your metrics you know help us understand why you chose those help us understand why your goals are to increase that because we know they're not going to say we've got too many teachers we're going to cut back that's clear so help us understand why you're moving in that direction and then we can make that decision as a as a finance group and as a council and as a town is that where we want our resources to go? So a couple of things one is. Um, we're getting kind of really close to time. It is 6 o'clock. Um, so um, two things to keep in mind. One is more data um, always lends perspective to the lens about uh, where you are. But I hope that, if anything, that it also forces us to take a look at, um, I think there was a term used last year, what is our cohort that we want to? Because having, I think there's 30, 26, I don't know, 30 up there. I mean, nine of those communities have a low attack rate than Scarborough. Um, and I think that the cohort that we would look at as a total municipality would be different as the cohort that we look at, or peer group, uh, that we look at on the school side. It could be very, very different. So um, defining the data set and who we're going to compare ourselves to in a smaller segment is better because this is nice to know but too much um, to be able to compare. The other piece is that there's a lot of um, things to consider. One is um, so when you're talking about the balance of our, the value of our community, I remember, I, and I'm dating myself here, um, it was when Steve Ross was on the town council, whatever year that was, I don't remember, in which he provided an analysis that's very similar to this, but only for the town of Scarborough, and it showed an inverted chart, and it was between education and other services. And it was like, um, um, I don't know, it, it was like the affinity uh, sign, it, you know, you, as one goes down, it's proportional as the other one goes up and it kind of crosses paths and reverts. Because I remember whenever year that was, the ratio was significantly different. And I think a lot of that has to deal with the growth of the town over the time, as well as the change in the needs of services as well. Because I want to say at that time, the adult, and it was funny because back then it was, um, we're spending too much on education and that was like at 61%. I, I, I want to say 61 cents on the dollar, to, or it was like a 60-40 split it was significantly higher in comparison to where we are now. So um, we kind of need to understand the history of where we've been in order to know where I think we want to go in the future. And so this, I think this is great to help us, but it also poses a lot of questions um, going forward. But it's, yeah. you know. I, mean, I think debt is an issue that, that is, as he flagged, I, is, yeah. is, is I'm curious to know more about, um, mm -hmm. not just spending, but I, I don't, I don't know for sure that the school debt is being reflected in that last education chart. But, right. but um, at the end of the day, it's about tax rate. And what I heard you say is really the only way to increase education spending is to take it from the town side. 
I mean, let's face it. No, no. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily stand by that. I say if we well, set, if what we, I heard you say. right, if we box ourselves in and we set a goal that's unrealistic, yep. if we set a goal of, of, of only increasing our revenue by a, a max of three percent, then yes, absolutely. That part of it is going to be a conjunction with that three percent tax increase, and the other part is going to have to, if we make that a priority, we can't spend a dollar and three cents. So that means that you know, if we're going to shift from whatever that number is, I mean, maybe it's not 53 cents, maybe it really is 55 cents or 56 cents or whatever it may be. If we're really going to shift more emphasis on the educational expending expenditures, a couple cents here and there, it's got to come a couple cents out of somewhere else. Maybe one cent comes from the tax increase and two cents comes from municipal side. That's the that's the challenge that we have, yeah, right? Both priorities, but um, exactly. And as Councilor Rowan uh, mentioned at the outset, revenues aren't considered in this equation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we do a, an exceptional job in terms mm -hmm. of maximizing non-property tax revenues mm -hmm. as a way of um, mm -hmm. being able to start new programs. In fact, we don't even start programs unless we have an offsetting revenue for them. So that's part of the equation. If tax rate is what matters at the end of the day to Mm -hmm. Many people, that's that's where the rubber hits the road. Mm -hmm. I think you have to consider how we're funding municipal operations, not simply s cutting expenditures for sake of uh, simplicity. I think it's all part of the discussion, mm -hmm. absolutely. But it's a big it's discussion. A good, it's that's a good discussion. framework. Yeah, that's a good framework. So um, just just for um, uh, disclosure, so I just want people to understand that this is uh, Councilor Rowan's work. Nothing against you, sir, but I just want to distance ourselves. But the um, I throw throw them out, throw them out of the <laughs> Not to consider the source, but no, uh, the, the purpose of saying that is that this is an individual's um, own research. It's not something that was com uh, composed by staff and um, as well, or nor by the committee. So if anybody wants any of this information, it's not something that we retain because it is his presentation. Um, and I'm saying that with all due respect and all uh, appreciation for sharing it, but I don't want people to start saying I want all this documentation. It's not ours, so <laughs> uh, we won't be able to provide it. But thank you very much. I thought it was extremely useful. Extremely useful. Uh, to move forward, um, I did want to at least uh, hand out if you hadn't seen it yet. It's, it's me, I did ask today. It's going to be uploaded. Um, this is the agenda uh, for tomorrow's joint session. Um, that's um, that's ahead of time. So I apologize for not getting it up sooner. Um, and last but not least, what I did want to mention, we had originally planned to kind of have a conversation about what future topics did we want to bring up. Um, if you're okay with it, I think that we can table that to the February meeting, um, unless you really have an issue. Um, but we have some follow-ups anyway, so Yeah, we'll have follow-up on fund balance. Uh, we'll yep. have uh, Bernstein Shore at that meeting. We'll yep. have financial statements. So you'll have enough to certainly keep you busy for your next meeting. Absolutely. And then we'll also include a discussion of future items. And uh, with that, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.